Hi. Good late afternoon, everyone. I'd like to discuss with you my research over the past many years, which is in the domain of human enhancement, which is looking at not just the individual Umwelt, but the possibility of connect home of the human physiology and cognitive properties. This area is all about what could become of human nature. Certainly, we would contain many of the values, the experiences that we have as biological animals, but looking beyond that, more as digitality, electronics interface with us through human-machine interaction, what could we become with this type of immersivity, transparency, almost indistinguishable invisibility of technology? It's all around us, it has become part of us, and we will have many different issues about ethics, and who we might become. But the bottom line of it all is, what is the future of human enhancement? Where are we going? Who do we want to become? I look at it from two perspectives. Number one is life expansion. Taking the notion of life extension, looking beyond our limitation of biology, which for the human animal is approximately 122, 123 years, to what we might become through the implementation of design. Now, one of the most interesting innate characteristics of human to me is our love of exploration and our ability to innovate. We're inventors. We love to problem solve. And that ties very neatly into design because design, as you know, is an iterative process. We're constantly reforming, remaking our concepts so that they're not only feasible, they're doable. Design is all about problem solving. The second part of my interest in this area of life expansion is as a researcher, part scientist, part designer, part artist, part theoretician, looking at how we might develop a field for people who would like to live healthy as long as they can, with as much conscious spirit and productivity as possible, the exploration of us and the innovation in our insights, and also live beyond the limitation of 122 years. And you might say, well, certainly that's a long time to live, and who would want to live longer than that? But many of us do. You take someone who's in their hundreds, who is still vital, who still has a tremendous joie de vivre, that person ought to live longer if he or she wants to. And certainly you might say, well, what is the ethics of it? What about the haves and the have-nots? Only the rich can have this. Not so. We know from basic economics that the price is driven down. And certainly with the idea of Buckminster Fuller, one of my favorite designers of all time, as you know, a great architect and thinker about the world game plan, how we could solve the problems if we just look beyond the, the narrow divide of distribution, the biases that prevent distribution, and enough for everyone, everywhere. If the future of nanotechnology is as promising as it proposes to be, the molecular manufacturing will be desktop, and everyone will be able to have enough food, enough clothing, enough medical care. So that's a dream of the future that I have, and one that I think is very promising. So when we talk about radical life extension and looking at life expansion, you might say, what would we expand into? What might we become? Well, certainly today, we're a biological species. We are a conglomeration of biological cells. As Lynn Margulis said, we are a conglomeration of bacteria that evolved. And what are we evolving into? Well, part of us is evolving into digitality. We're data across streams, through Twitter, through interfaces, through all sorts of abilities to adapt to our environment. So, let's assume, how did this all come around? It came around by a gentleman called Norbert Weiner. He worked in the concept of cybernetics, and cybernetics certainly dealt with machines, it dealt with warfare, but it also dealt with space exploration. And one of our great explorations that we still drive for with innovation, beyond any comparison, especially with the X Prize, is space exploration, mining the asteroids. But how does this tie into life expansion? The idea of the cyborg, an old idea, certainly lost its 21st century spin, but the cyborg was about the human and machines integrated so that the human could exist in zero gravity. Why? Because zero gravity could affect our muscular uh, system and our bone density. In zero G, 
5G, we would need a different type of body to exist. So we're not in zero G, but we could become in zero G, but where are we? We're not simply in the biosphere all the time, we're in the cybersphere. We spend just as much time, generally, in our computers or working with elements of digitality as we do with elements of oxygen. So we take a look at this. Where are we going? We're adapting to what we might become. And it is my view, which is the cyborg view, although I'm not a cyberneticist, nor do I value the term cyborg any longer, but it's a great historical route for what we are becoming. The transhuman is a notion of living fully and richly through our lives and adapting and moving and evolving through our own ability to steer our future through the innovations and explorations in our sciences, technologies, and numerous advances through a transdisciplinary perspective. So along the way, the larger question lingers. How can we engineer or design who we might become? Aren't we fragile? Won't our future be fragile no matter what type of system we're in? Yes. But at least we're dealing with that fragility. Medicine has made enormous strides in helping people who are dying of disease. You take St. Jude's Children's Hospital, where children used to be called incurable. Now there are cures to some of these cancerous diseases. Many of the diseases of neuropsychology have affected the way we are dealing with depression and all sorts of diseases that children have, ADD, Asperger's syndrome, that are growing. What is that all about? How could we deal with that, plus our own levels of depression and anxiety as we're becoming more fractured and diversified as a species in all these different environments? So, we take a look at our own bodies and how we're engineering aspects of it. We have transplants, we have implants, we have add-ons, we have enhancements. Certainly, there are over 100,000 people each year waiting for a transplant, and many of them have to die because there is no transplant, there is no solution to it. So, we're farming out these, we're developing pigs to grow organs, we're looking at manufacturing organs, and we're looking at stem cells for building our own organs and freezing them for a time when we may need to have a transplant. But what else is there? An example here is prosthetics. Prosthetic devices that enable those without their bodily functions to have very interesting and sometimes better devices than our biological devices. The only good thing that I can ever say that comes from any type of war and hatred is that the engineering and design sensibility to build prosthetics that have given people who have suffered a very stunning leg or an arm. So where is this all going? What are we talking about here as far as a future body, a transhuman body, to live longer outside of biology? I like to look at it as a type of platform-diverse system. If we look at biology as a substrate, we look at cybernetics or electronic or digitality as another substrate, what if we could cross between these substrates? What would it require for us? We already have avatar bodies in Second Life in the metaverse. We also have multiple personalities in all of our email exchanges, and we can become multiple people in different environments. But on a basis of living longer, we need to look at combining this biosphere that we love so much, that we live in, that we want to protect and prolong, and this cybersphere, this other type of environment, this digital world that we've become so familiar with as if it was our own offspring and our parents as well. So the people who enjoy thinking about this as an exploratory adventure, think about who wants this, who would want to live longer, the people who simply do not want to die right now. You say, well, no one wants to die right now. Certainly, I don't want to die right now. But for those of us who have faced life-death situations, we know how fragile we are again. And our base safety net for staying alive is, of course, being with loved ones, having an animal companion, having financial security, having family love and support, and being mentally sound working out, being as healthy as we can for as long as we can. And if we're going to invest the amount of money that we do today in health and our own maintenance, why would we just stop it because all of a sudden 122 or 123 comes around and that's the maximum lifespan that humans have had so far? So my option here is to come up with an idea for a whole body prosthetic that could be an alternative design. Now, it could be bio 
biological, semi-biological, non-biological, or simply um, cybernetic, digital, whatever uh, medium or substrate that comes along next. So it would be a whole body prosthetic that would house the brain and its mind to perform outside biology or with biology, but it would be a substitute or an add-on body. Now, I see this as a field that could be emerging, and the evidence is, as I said, prosthetics, the advances in prosthetics with artificial intelligence and uh, certain robotics, the advances in nanotechnology and nanomedicine, looking at uh, molecular manufacturing and moving atom by atom so that we can deal with substrates and matter at a molecular basis, and putting all these elements together that we could possibly back up the brain. You say, what, why would we back up the brain? Well, certainly, we back up our computers on a daily basis, if not on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Why not back up our brains? Aren't we a little bit silly that we haven't done that yet? Well, it's not as easy as that. In fact, some of the world's leading cognitive scientists are working in that area, as well as neuroscientists, thinking about how we could back it up. And that's essential for a whole body prosthetic, because if you have a body, you have to have a brain in it. So we get into the issue of uh, the Cartesian issue of dualism and looking at if the mind is separate than the body, is that correct? Or is the mind in the brain, which is part of the body? Or can we just have a disembodied brain dealing in cyberspace like an upload? Or what do we do? Where do we meet here? Well, I'm of a different school of thought than most philosophers and theoreticians in the academic arts who talk about disembodiment that if we go into cyberspace as persons, we will become disembodied agency. I disagree. I think no matter what substrate we're in, we will still have some kind of body. We need our perceptual apparatus. We need to have adventure and exploration, not just through our cognitive abilities, but through our emotions, through feeling, through experiencing. So, when we take on a first prototype in the design process, it's usually a theoretical conceptual concept, and then we build it, and then we test it and build it again. The first time I built the future body prosthetic, Primo Post Human, was in 1997, and it was extremely successful. Not monetarily, because it was before its time, and I couldn't build it, but I conceptualized it. It was a very successful concept. Now I'm looking at it again because technology has come up to the times. Back then, it was nanobioinfocogno technologies. But today, those technologies that I worked on, theoretically, are now making strides in their own fields, so I have to revisit this whole situation. So here's my original drawings for Primo Post Human. And as you notice, I dealt with the mind, the body, and the brain. And today, I still deal with it, but first the, brain, the body, then the brain, then personhood, because it's the continuation of our identity, our self, who we are, that we want to preserve. No matter how long we live, no matter what circumstances we go through, it's our self, our person, that to have a continuity of self would resolve in you being suspended over time, whether it's in the biological system, semi-biological system, or cybernetic system. So here's my original design in 1997, uh, the transitional human. And the little uh, mock-up company I developed was Ageless Thinking. And you could see that I came up with different ideas of that the skin would regenerate itself. Well, I met a, a dermatologist on the plane here, and he was telling me about a patent in a couple of years that it's an injectable where the skin could feasibly develop its own collagen. And there's many other issues there with plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, dermatology, um, nanomedicine coming on board, genetic engineering, dealing with the telomeres in our body that shorten as our, our daughter cells regenerate over and over and then lose their ability to regenerate. This is just the beginning. So eventually we could be able to have an MRI tell us if the onset of any type of white damage in our brain, any onset of dementia or senality. We can look at our bone density and see where we're having a degenerative amount of bone loss or muscle loss. We can look at our spinal column and see where some of the um, bones in the spine are fusing. We may have to go in to intervene. These are ways we can see inside the body, and that's amazing. We take it for granted sometimes with the MRI, but we can see inside the body. Now we need to talk to the body. So if we had nanomedicine, then we'd have little computers go into the body and talk to us. So that's my brain on the MRI. That's my body with the bone density and muscle density. And um, that's my body talking about the future body design. I think at this stage ought to look biological, 
like we are today and enhance and augment ourselves as we choose. And there will have issues about morphological freedom, who has the right to enhance and who ought never to be coerced to enhance, because the extent of human enhancement is a personal choice. Each individual, in my view anyway, has a right to determine how long he or she wants to live or can live. Now, you might again say that's the have-nots, have it's an economic issue, that's where you live. Yes, that's very true, but we've learned over the years that the cost goes down, that people by and large love to stay alive and protect their family and keep each other alive. So what I want to end with today is looking at some of these robotic designs. And that arm is exquisitely beautiful. And these pieces of the body are beautiful to look at like sculpture, like an Henri Moore or Jean Hans Arp. Any of the beautiful designs are part of the bodily designs. They have movement, they have sensitivity. So if designers could get together and design bodies for us to live longer in a durable, less uh, vulnerable uh, existence in an envelope, then perhaps it could become a new field. And certainly with the growth in life extension as a, not just a business, but a major field in of itself, then adaptive body design will most likely be located in the intersection of product design, basic design, science, and technology. And through that, there would be hope for people who do want to uh, extend their, their rights to stay alive and to live longer and healthier. And also to think about how we're dealing with the body and the mind issue. What is consciousness? How do we deal with identity as we transgress and transverse across different substrates and different media? And certainly there'll be the hoes that hold on to their chair and say, no, I'm not going into the future. I don't believe in living longer and stop this. The old ought to die and make way for the young. So be it, if that's your choice. But if it's not your choice and you're part of those of us who love life so dearly and want to give back to the world in many ways and continue spreading positive, exploratory, and innovative ideas forward, then you might consider being a part of this growing field of life extension, human enhancement, and eventually life expansion. Thank you.